dubbed in her day the Starvation Doctor, a latter-day moniker of Washington's first female serial killer, top two by my reckoning, when it became clear her death toll between 1907 and 13 was at least 14. Those being the ones, read patients, and come medical experiment guinea pigs, either starved to death on one of her supposed therapeutic diets and enema sessions that would last for hours, were found to have suicided in bizarre fashion in and around her sanatorium in name only. Wilderness Heights, Ola, Washington, United States. The locals aptly named it Starvation Heights. Skin and Bones patients would regularly hit the nearby town and scrounge for food. And still, any half-decent serial killer needs to have a suspected list to add to their confirmed. Those 14 were just in the state of Washington. Then there were also her patients, a euphemism for victims, back in her home state of Minnesota. The total, therefore, gets over 20. We'll never know exactly. Even when the death toll was, at one stage, still in single digits, Washington health authorities knew things were rather sus. Patients, as well as relatives, complaints were mounting. She continually advocated her innocence to anyone who would listen, claimed these patients were inoperable and terminal cases, merely carried on her starvation cure all, even getting prosecuted, ultimately proved an issue, given the victims had all entered into her treatments voluntarily. Her and her husband's comeuppance only came about after the death of a rich Australian socialite, Claire Williamson. That's her on the left. When she died, she weighed, by my reckoning, uh, 20 kilograms. Her sister Dora was a bit luckier. The before and after photos of Dora's time at Starvation Heights leaves one a mental image that lays a good testament to what was going on. Besides being the heiresses to a fortune worth about US dollars 30 million today, the remaining Williams sister had friends also in high places, a British embassy and a well-to-do uncle. They all wanted justice and they funded an investigation which saw her prosecuted in 1913. Found guilty of culpable murder and sentenced by a judge to the bizarre term of 2 to 20 years, Am I the only one whose brain explodes at the very mention of the American justice system? That trial proved to be a global sensation. New Zealanders are tucking into their morning cornflakes and got to read about The Sanatorium of Death Murder by Starving Starvation Tragedy something unholy before promptly tucking into an extra bowl for good measure amongst the death toll in washington was a new zealander stanley wakelin one of ten children born in greytown stan had a low-level job at the wellington post office before embarking on a one-way trip to the u.s in september 1909 aged 29 Reading between the lines, the only ailment he suffered from was a type of anxiety disorder, commonly called hypochondria. Wakeland's sole overseas destination was, you guessed it, Wilderness Heights. In many other historic formations of his three months stay there, the ones I read and saw, three weeks of those by the way lying dead decomposing in the grounds, Wakeland is labelled as the wealthy son of a British lord, or similar. This was certainly not the case. His background, as I've outlined, was far more humble. I'm either presuming other sources got it wrong, or when Wakeland arrived there, he claimed to be of noble stock to bolster his own credentials. By now, Hazard could be picky, her picks being rich pricks. Not, say, low-level postal workers. By now, you have probably twigged as to what was the motivation for Hazard to bump off her patients. Money, exorbitant fees, 
then dig into the estates of the victims as their bodies declined. Naturally, along went their mental faculties. She would gain their trust and with it access to their bank accounts, either by power of attorney or left money in their wills. Wakelin was a prime example of this in action. He signed away his life savings over to Mr and Mrs Hazard, the rather paltry sum of $500, or was it pounds? Either way, multiply that by 30 and you get to around the total in modern terms. Hardly a fortune. Discovering he was nowhere near as wealthy as he portrayed must have come as a shock and disappointment to the murderers. The murder or murderers, being either Mr or Mrs Hazard, how can we be sure Wakeland was bumped off by the couple? Well, 99% sure. Stanley's decomposed body was found with a gunshot in the head. The Hazards put it down to suicide. Sounds a possibility for sure. Only it's rather hard to kill yourself, then dispose of the gun. That's right, there was no gun discovered immediately around the scene. Nor did a Kiwi medical tourist like him own a rifle to use see the need to go hunting to fill in his days. Unlikely to have had the energy, even if he was driven to hunt deer. Then, if not more incriminating, were the patient's records. According to the files in the clinic, Wakeland was receiving treatment during the time he was in the neighbouring forest decomposing. Surely enough to deter other Kiwi evangelists. If only... When Mrs. Hazard got out of the clink at the end of 1915, ridiculously paroled after two years, and then to add further to the case I have that the US justice system is unique, unique being charitable, at the same time I poked my eyes out, and she was pardoned shortly thereafter, in no small part and due to campaigning of the global adherence to fasting as a cure for everything. When I say everything... At one point, Hazard made this disturbing and gut-tuning claim. She would happily, quote, eat any bubonic germs, end quote, to prove the efficacy of her treatment to stem the local outbreak. In retrospect, a great opportunity lost. Someone should have taken her up on that offer. Near at 50... Needing a bolt hole, whilst the dust settled, bodies fully decomposed, stateside, she turned to one of her, if not her number one, devotee, a Whanganui jeweller and head of the local commerce guild, Lloyd Jones. How big of a fan was he? Reading this lavish praise and calling him over the top sounds somewhat light. He'd gone all the way to the States to persuade the just-released jailbird to come south. Historically, Jones had been championing fasting in New Zealand for a good decade prior. That news clipping fasting for a cure, come promo, was from 1907. Had regularly been in the local news when it came to the fasting craze, sometimes for the wrong reasons, one of those being the untimely death of a Whanganui local under his tutelage. For the benefit of overseas viewers, a tangi is a Maori funeral. In this case, it was a last farewell for a Maori chief by the name of Edward Arangi. Mr Arangi was a middle-aged broke with a number of pre-existing conditions, stemming from the fact he was obese. The prime reason he began to fast in 1907 was to lose weight, a radical option I appreciate. No one can criticise his intentions and application towards that goal, which I'm pleased to say at about day 32 was reaping real rewards. He had lost a whopping 20 kilograms, or what say about 45 pounds. Day 33, not so good. Dead. You may be wondering why I'm using a cartoon rendition of Jones and not a real photo. Put simply, I could answer them to say I couldn't find a photo of him. However, that cartoon will serve nicely to indicate the contempt the local papers had for starvation diets. It's a direct result of the New Zealand press lampooning Jones, who the New Zealand doctors at the time weren't shy in proclaiming the dangers of sustained starvation. 
one doctor wrote, it is clear to me that Jones has not travelled far. If he had been to, say, India, looked at the emancipated populace there, Mr Jones wouldn't be of the mind thinking starvation was exactly a great practice. Mr and Mrs H were sold on Jones's invite on the boat soon thereafter. In days after arriving, Mrs H was back into it, starting the same sham as before. First from the Wanganui home of Jones, then branching out into her own clinic in the town. Then as business burgeoned, and soon outgrew the 25,000 population of Wanganui. Speaking further about the town, two ticks. It does have a history of quirky things that have gone on there. Number one, a punk anarchist blowing himself to smithereens in 1982. Then there's another incident involving a bomb when a strung out local took the occupants of the local radio station hostage in 1996, threatening to detonate the bomb in his backpack unless the station played the Rainbow Connection solidly for 24 hours. Lucky old you. There's a link for both those videos in the description. Back into it. Hazard outgrew Wanganui in short order. Off she went, north to the bright lights and deeper pockets of Auckland. There her three and a half year run in New Zealand would come to an abrupt end as complaints began to roll in. To add more context, add background to the health system in New Zealand at the time. In 1907, a Tuhonga suppression bill was introduced to dissuade unscrupulous charlatans preying on sick Maori and gullible locals alike, protect them from local medical voodoo, in particular push Maori into the mainstream medical system, away from what were in effect village witch doctors. I've done a previous video on the situation. In short, those that flouted the law, peddled bumpkin, weren't just fined. The worst offenders did a stretch, including a couple of white witches, Tohonga. Anyway, another body that was clamping down on spruikers and mounty banks was the professional body for the doctors. They were one of those complaining about Hazard, portraying herself as a medical doctor. Shortly thereafter, an investigating police officer made his way to the top of this building knocked on the door of suite 513 which was opened by a welcoming lady to which Mr Plod inquired I was wanting to talk to Dr Hazard he unaware that he was staring at her she unaware of his intentions Hazard replied I am Dr Hazard not the best starts for her defence lawyer the laws in New Zealand have been somewhat stricter than the US as to who can call themselves a medical practitioner. Hazard was charged, went to court, where that advert I showed you before, the one about a bloodless surgeon, formed part of the damning evidence. Found guilty, fined, told in no certain terms, you are not back home, love. Stemming from the court case and the press coverage, and the New Zealand public were now conversant, the more diligent authorities, having gone one better or two better than their US counterparts, they had found out she wasn't even a qualified osteopath. And those certificates hanging from her clinic walls, the qualifications she presented full stop, were all forgeries as well. The public were reacquainted with the Williamson case and those cutting headlines from before. Something unholy. Starvation tragedy. Murder by starvation. Sanatorium of death. Her name was now mud in the background of a world war, one in which, as a percentage of the population, New Zealand lost more than even France, Hazard was now unwelcome. Her reaction? She used the same tactic as back in Washington, claimed to be the victim of overzealous New Zealand health authorities. It was petty jealousy within the medical profession, raised her own status to that of a martyr, Meanwhile, behind the scenes, she planned her comeback. 
and there's the old adage that bad news spreads better than good. Her support in the US had not diminished due to the Williamsons, patients dropping like flies, the odd negative article or 20. Disturbingly, her fame had grown. On your screen was her newer, swankier sanatorium back in Olala, technically a school of health, since by then, US authorities, along with 99% of the public, knew she now needed a short leash. The most vociferous group against her setting up shop again, being the surrounding locals. Still, no authority in the land was going to be able to stop people doing stupid things. And desperate or vulnerable patients, soon to be victims, went willingly to her for a cure, like, say, a sclerosis of the liver. In 1935, her wings were clipped somewhat when her school of health and burnt to the ground. The reasons given for the fire are variously listed as accident, insurance job, or a stern time-to-go message left by the locals. Still an incorrigible a rogue like her and couldn't stay on the straight and narrow. The fire was but a speed bump. 1936, with a ready stream of people still going to her door, she was still at it, now facing a new court case for impersonating a medical doctor. But by then, in her late 60s, her own health was failing and she wouldn't get to see justice. She sought treatment closer to home. Taps finger on desk, thinking what sort of treatment that would be. Mm. Her own patented starvation course. And the game taps fingers. Mm, I wonder what happened. What was the outcome? Indeed, it was a death bathed in irony. Starvation. Don't you dare go now. If you like the story about a scoundrel preying upon the vulnerable, those seeking a miracle, I can go one better than her. Way better, or technically worse. A despicable creature called Milan Brick. Another masquerading doctor with zero qualifications who left, literally, not metaphorically, a whole cemetery of patients in the Cook Islands. Link to this one and the others I mentioned, the White Witches, punk anarchist strapped with dynamite on a one-way mission to blow up the state apparatus, plus Kermit the Frog singing the Rainbow Connection for a day solid, the latter video being one of my faves, could end up being your fave too, are all below. Thanks for tuning in today. I'll say goodbye for now. Merry Christmas 2023.